All right, well, we've got a couple of people on, so we may as well get the ball rolling. So basically, with, um, well, I don't know, this is the first one we've actually done on the live page. We've done some on the private kinetic therapies page. So I'm Talisha and I'm here with Jackson Tisdell. Both of us are podiatrists, both have our special interest in exercise and sports podiatry. Um, between both of us, so in the last few weeks, I've done a fair bit of lecturing through Western Sydney University with a few of their third year students, predominantly on exercise prescription, orthotic prescription. And one of the main questions that came up quite a few times in a couple of the lectures were from students asking about exercise compliance. And between um, myself and Jackson, who Jackson also does a fair bit of mentoring with new graduates and recent graduate podiatrists, that seems to be a little bit of a theme that's popped up as well. So we thought today that's what we would cover um, because it's even not just students and new grads, it seems to be one of the biggest issues that, yeah, is across the board with podiatrists as far as how do we get patients or clients to be compliant with their treatment programs in general, but specifically exercises. So. Jackson, do you want to sort of give us a little bit of a rundown of sort of what your conversations with your pods the last couple of weeks have been? Yeah, oh, pretty pretty basically just a lot of questions coming in about um, how do you get people to adhere to their exercise program? Um, and yeah, just just people getting um, really frustrated with, with essentially clients not not doing what you what you ask them to do with their exercise plan. Um, and it's a it's a really um, common one, and and we. Um, yeah, I, I feel them, and and um, it's certainly something in the past that we've um, that I've had trouble with as well, but not too much lately since I've sort of uh, sort of changed the way of thinking about it. Um, yeah, so what, what are your thoughts on it? A similar thing, I think historically years ago when I first started getting a bit more into exercise prescription and exercise therapies, it was. A bit of a hurdle and initially it was quite funny I don't know how it was for you but as um, and this is one thing I was talking about with the uni students as initially when people weren't being compliant with the exercise programs that we were doing or I was asking or trying to get them to do I would sort of take it on board and take it personally and oh my god what's going on and what have I done wrong um, but then over time sort of my a lot of it all sort of boils down to communication, I feel. Um, so, yeah, essentially where my things have evolved and not just with um, exercises in general, but my entire treatment practice is very much more communication focused. And I think for a lot of people that seems to be the key in getting the compliance, but there are a lot of factors that feed into that. Um, so what do you reckon as far as you go when you say that you've changed a few of your practices in relation to that? What do you think you've changed compared to when you were first practicing to now? Yeah, so the, the, the whole mindset of when you're prescribing exercises is um, flipping it from a, being a, um, a dictation to, to a collaboration. So you really have to, to work with the, the client um, and, and they, they almost... Um, have to tell you what to prescribe them and you and you work around that like as far as um, asking the right questions in your subjective history taking is probably the the biggest thing that I've tried to overemphasize um, more recently is that the questions I'm asking about exercise and about rehabilitation so um, questions like do they um, understand the benefits of, of or just generally what are their thoughts on on strength training and have they done any strength training or rehabilitation before? Have they had an injury in the past, even a long time ago? Um, where they, if, have they sprained their ankle with football or something and did they have to do exercise to get it better? And what did they think about that process? So how did, did, that, did it help? Um, why, why did it help or why didn't it help? Did you like the exercise program? Um, what did you like about it? What didn't you like about it? Um, uh, do you, and then so you get that sort of past rehab, past exercise history taking. I think is 
really important because then that frames in your mind how you're going to approach prescribing exercises to this person. Um, and then as you're prescribing exercises to them, you need to ask them questions as well. Like, hey, what does your day look like? You tell me, tell me a bit more about your story. What does your week look like? Um, you know, what do you do for work? Like what, um, what time do you have in the day to potentially do exercises? Is doing 30 minutes worth of exercises per day, is that going to be too much for you? Or would you prefer to have them broken up into small little bits or um, just ask a lot, a lot of questions and that yeah. really sets you up well to be able to, to prescribe the exercise program um, to better suit them. 100%. Totally agree with that. Yeah. And so I think um, like one thing that I do stemming from that is, yeah, like if you find out what they're doing normally within a week. So for someone, if they're already training a fair amount or they're already going to a Pilates class or they're already going to the gym or something like that, if we're just adding on an extra layer of exercise that's already they're pushed for time, that creates a barrier that they may not be able to do. And one thing that I find works really well is if they're already doing some physical activity, so say they're going to a gym class, um, incorporating their rehab into what they're already doing. So you can actually make rehab and fitness combine. And so they can do their rehab whilst they're doing their fitness and it doesn't feel like they're doing rehab. So one of the things that I do, and this comes down to the history taking that you mentioned and sort of finding out what they're already doing. So if they already attend, say, an aqua aerobics class or a Pilates class or they do some personal training one-on-one -on -one sessions or they go to a gym, what you tend to find, and I'm sure you would have found this as well, um, especially when we're in Foster and what we're doing there, is a lot of um, fitness professionals are really open to communicating with health professionals. And if you're saying, okay, well, I've got so-and-so, they've got this condition. And at this point in time, these particular exercises are probably a bit too advanced or they're maybe not be overly suitable for them. And we've got these couple of regressions. So when it comes to this point in the class or whatever, can we look to incorporate that exercise specific to that person? So they're still getting that social participation. They're still doing what they're normally doing and they're doing their rehab at the same time. So it's not adding that extra layer of, oh God, I've got even more homework to do. Yeah, definitely. And then, and then um, so I think back to um, what I was saying about setting it up well and, and making sure that you um, understand the person, understand their day, what their week looks like, understand and, and work together, ask them questions about how much exercise they think is gonna be too much and what they're gonna be able to do. Um, when you get them on board uh, and, and you've prescribed a, a really good exercise program, fits well into their day, um, I think the next issue that podiatrists will have is, is keeping them on board. So, um, so that's all well and good to set it up. That's, that's what you've got to do from the start. But then um, what do we do then if, you know, two or three weeks into it, then they come, start coming back and saying, oh, haven't done them this week. You know, that's, that's the issue. I think sometimes the long-term compliance so um my thoughts on that uh, would you agree with that like the the like the, they have a lot of motivation early um if you if you set up a program well but then their sort of long-term compliance can can take it off well i can take a so if we might go right 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 back to the start and yeah. it's not just based on, so this is coming right back to when we're even devising the exercise program, is it's being able to identify the what and the why. Yeah. So, and again, this comes into the communication. One, we need to understand the pathology and being able to, one, to identify what the patient goals are. So if someone comes in and they go, I just want to get back to walking my dog on the beach that's their overall rehabilitation goal. Someone else, they might want to, okay, I can run a half marathon, but I'm looking to run a full marathon or I can run 10 Ks before I get knee pain. But once I hit 12 Ks, my knees are cactus. So kind of figuring out what their end point is and then their start point, and then actually being able to communicate to them why they're doing 
the ex or why we're prescribing an exercise. So in, because if we just tell, if they don't understand the what and the why, then that in itself creates a barrier because if they go, well, they just told me to do car phrases. I don't know why I saw someone else. They told me to do car phrases, didn't yeah. do anything. And that's one thing that sort of long-term that can lose interest. So if we kind of um, go back and if we understand or have a good understanding of what the actual pathology is and why the problem's there and then tying in the exercise prescriptions specific to their goals and like, to be honest, patients, majority of the time, if they come in, they don't give a shit about their tendon compliance or their tendon stiffness. They yeah. care about the fact that they're getting pain or something is not letting them be able to run. We may care about the tendon compliance or stiffness, but we have to frame it and communicate it in a way that actually is meaningful to them. So if we go, okay, you've got this problem going on, go into the details of, not over complicating it, but in explaining it in a way that they understand. And then we are looking to do this exercise because it will achieve this result within the tissue or whatever, and it will make you more likely or build up your capacity to participate in that goal activity. So taking it right back to the reason we're prescribing this and I, like creating it that we're doing this so you can achieve your goal. It's not, I'm just giving you car phrases because everyone gets car phrases. Does that make sense? Yeah. 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 One of, one of my biggest things. So, so communication right from the start is basically what you were saying, communication and goal setting, um, yep. relating it back to the, the, their long-term goal of what, so always describing, so demonstrating the exercise, getting them to do it and then explaining why they're doing it and why it benefits them. And if they can understand that, then they're more likely to, to be on board with it. Um, but one of the things that has really improved my long-term or sort of intermediate to long-term compliance lately is I've been really hyper-focusing on, on having um, some milestones to tick off along the way through the, yep. through the um, rehab process. So some, um, I guess, you know, your short, medium and your long-term goal setting. Um, so they can actually see that they are making progress in their rehab plan. Um, so they might not be where they want to be or they might still have pain, but if you can have some little goals written up yep. for them and saying, okay, um, so within next week, I want you to be able to do um, 20 repetitions or I want you to be able to um, walk around the block without pain as opposed to, um, you know, just and just map it out for them. And then each time they come in, if they've been able to do something, you tick it off and, and you can say, look, we've achieved this and we've achieved this. And that reinforces to them that they are actually getting somewhere. So if you don't have that reinforcement of goal setting, even though um, if the real short-term goals, I think is really important to tick off along the way. 100%. And especially with the more chronic conditions. So whenever you're dealing with, say, tendon pathology, hey, what beer are you drinking? Um, Wolf of the Willows Pacific Sour. It's really good. Yeah, I'd, I've only had one set. I've got to get on to them. Anyway, we'll jump back onto the beer later. Um, yeah, God, now I got distracted by the beer. What was I saying? Something about tendons. Tendons, tendons, tendons. That's it. Um, yeah, so I think having those sort of short-term goals and having more than one outcome that we're focused on because pain is not a good indicator of progress. So I think having functional outcomes plus pain because especially with tendon pathology you can almost guarantee that at some point in the rehab process there's going to be a flare so you may see them two or three times and first time they're in pain you start the treatment program appointment number two they may be quite optimistic or oh, things are feeling a lot better than what they have for quite a while appointment three whatever's happened they felt good they've possibly done a little bit too much life has been stressful they've had a flare and they feel like they're back to square one but yeah like if you have those little mini functional outcomes and just mapping things out you go yeah you have had a flare but you're not back to square one we've just taken half a step backwards that's fine we just regather regroup reassure them that the world is not ending and you just keep building on from there Yep, hundred percent. And I actually give them a, a printout, so like a, a management plan, um, and we have we have all these goals written down. So say their goal is to get back to 
walking for 60 minutes without pain, um, maybe th three times a week, I'll have written out, okay, walking for 10 minutes without pain, walking for 20 minutes without pain, walking for 30 minutes without pain. Or if we don't want to make pain the, the focus, we'll, make, we'll say, can you walk 10 minutes comfortably? Can you walk 20 minutes comfortably? 30 minutes comfortably, 40 minutes comfortably, 60 minutes comfortably. Can you then walk 60 minutes comfortably twice a week? Can you walk 60 minutes comfortably three times a week? And then each appointment they come in, we'll tick, we'll cross those out and write, yes, we've achieved this. Um, and then and then they can see that and then you reprint it out and you give it back to them. And then they can, um, they'll, they'll, they can take that home and see that they've ticked off these things at that appointment they've been able to do this week, even yep. though they're still, even though they're still in pain. Yep. Um, and so, um, yeah, Dan, Dan told me that, um, which, which has been really cool, the, the milestone sort of stepping out your, your goals in the management plan and, and giving, it, giving it to them. It's really, really powerful. Yep. That's excellent. And how do you feel about, so this is something that I'll do, um, but do you do follow-ups in between? So because I, um, depending on the patient or the client, Often I may give them progressions because oftentimes if they're quite, um, yeah, switched on body aware and we're getting a little bit of that self-efficacy happening, I may give them two or three progressions for them to run through that they may achieve in between now and when their next review appointment is. Um, so it may be, well, I don't need to see you for three weeks unless there's a big problem. Um, but I'll sort of either touch base with an email or a phone call in between. Do you do Definitely. that? Definitely. I, I think um, the more contact you have, especially early on, you get better, better com, uh, com, compliance or better adherence um, and that you build more rapport and they, they build more trust in you because if someone, if someone tells you something, if, if you, if you're listening, if they're listening to us talk for 30 minutes in a console and we're giving them so much advice, they're only going to, really really understand like 10 percent of that or yep. i don't know what the stat is maybe it's like 20 percent or something and then of it's quite that, low how much they retain yeah and of that 20 percent that they retain then there's something like 10 percent of it is misinterpreted or something so yep. if you can have that repeated um follow-up really early on so um i like to even see people from the start like book them in twice a week for the first sort of three or four weeks book them in twice a week so they're coming into the gym doing exercise it'd be the same as if they were going to see a personal trainer twice a week like there's there's no um there's nothing wrong with doing it it's really really good because you can build that rapport and that continuous communication if they see you on a monday and they start doing some exercises at home and then they're back in on on thursday then they're not going to forget anything whereas if you're seeing them on monday and then waiting again until the following monday that's a long time especially if you don't also have um, phone calls, emails, um, that sort of thing to follow up and see how they're going. Uh, so yeah, what you said as well, it, touching base with them is really, really good. I saw a, um, a young girl, uh, like, like real young, like a 10 year old girl um, today and I, and I got her to, I'm not gonna see them again for a month because they're moving house and got all sorts of stuff going on. So um, they're not able to come back for a month. So I, I asked her, like I actually asked the 10 year old girl to email me um, from her mum's account to every week so that she has that repeated sort of um, uh, feedback from me and, and that um, accountability as well. And, and yep. she was really keen to do that. So, um, yeah, it's really helpful to touch base in between yeah. appointments. So I definitely find that that does help. And I do get that with patient one because it gives them a little bit of accountability and also one thing that you I don't know like not you specifically but clinicians in general um, a lot of um, patients or clients that they see they don't want to sort of be a burden or anything like that but letting them know that and I think email is always a good thing because it um, yeah gives that little bit of a buffer. You can address an email when you actually have time to it, but just really reassuring them that if you have any questions, if you're not sure about the technique of an exercise, if it's flaring something up, do not hesitate to contact me. I would rather you contact me. We may just need to do a slight dosage tweak, but don't wait until your next appointment. If there are any questions or concerns, get in touch with me straight away and we can address it then. And because that's one thing that happens. Some people, they might 
it might be two or three weeks between appointments. And if they've had an issue on day two, and then they just haven't done anything for three weeks. Yep, exactly. And, and once they do reach out to you, once they send that first email to update you on their progress, then that's their, their compliance, their, their, their rapport building with you is just t- goes to another level. Once they yep. send that first email, you can start like a really long email thread back and forth, just giving, continue, you're giving continual value to them. Um, and without them having to, to pay for it, it's in between appointments. So um, they really appreciate that. Um, and you're just, you're just helping them. It shows that you really want to help them. Um, yep. and make sure you, you, you um, really emphasize the fact that you, you can email me and I, I want you to email me and almost actually tell them on this day, please email me. Like, don't just make it a passing comment. Oh, if you have any issues, give us a call or send me an email because um, they won't. But um, say, I really, really want you to email me on this day. Then they, then they will most of the time. And um, that's how you get that, that compliance and that rapport, uh, which is really, really important for exercise adherence. Definitely. And so I'll um, do that actually on the appointment card. So when they're making their next appointment, we'll have appointment with Talisha on whatever day and then I'll have like email Talisha on this day yeah, about cool. or give me a phone call. It's usually email. That's easier. Yeah. Um, and then one other thing that, is a really big barrier and I think it creates the barrier during the consultation but also after is do you find that like I found personally with myself I've become less focused on technique than like you know when if there's 6,000 lines of script to perform the exercise correctly so how do you sort of tackle the doing the exercise correctly to actually not overload them like what cues will you focus on um so it's a three three sort of step process so first of all i um i demonstrate the exercise so i just do it and show them it and then i get them to so i don't even explain anything yet and then i get then i get them to copy me i I just show them i say this is what we're going to do then i do it and i say can you um, now you do it and I'll just get them to copy, see how they do it um, and then get them to do it repetitively um, and then make any necessary tweaks or some, some little cues. I'll probably give one or two, maximum two cues to an exercise. Um, you definitely don't want to be um, giving four or five or six things to focus on with an exercise. Like um, you only get, want to give them one or two um, and I, I wouldn't even go that far, especially if they're, if they're really a... a um, if their training experience is, is low, um, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't even give them that many. You'd just let them do the movement and work through the movement. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, don't, don't give too many cues. You can give a couple to improve things um, or if you think their technique is possibly contributing to their, their pain, obviously you want to cue them to, um, to change their technique if it's going to alter the loads going through the, through the structures. Um, that's an obvious one. But, um, yeah, definitely don't be... Don't be fluffing around the patient, like always just running around like, oh, activate this and, you know, switch this on and, and, and tilt this way. And you, you don't want to be doing that the whole time. <laughs> you just want to get them just... moving. Because um, yep. as soon as you start correcting them, like telling them four or five different things to work on, then they just be like, oh, I can't do this. Yeah. Yep. Too <laughs> so hard they're basket. Not, and they're not going to have that um, reinforcement of you telling them that at home either. So they're just going to be like, oh, what did he say again? And they're just going to, yeah, they're just going to be too hard. <laughs> so I tell you, I don't know if I was doing. I think I was doing it to an extent when we were working together. Um, so I will do with a few of the movements. It's because we all like movement variability. It exists. No one squats perfect. Like everyone's different. So there's no perfect way to squat. So I think um, getting them feeling it in the right place is more important. Yes. Definitely. So by a really good example is I had a um, yeah, girl my age who was referred by one of the sports physicians who just chronic patellofemoral pain. And we did a few running cues and basically just with changing a few of the running stride cues that essentially got rid of the pain. And that was the first time in sort of eight months that that had happened. But that's another story. 
But with the squat, that was a really interesting thing. So watching her do, we did a box squat. Um, instead of just doing like a goblet squat or a free weight squat, I like starting them off with a box squat because they do have that safety net of if they yeah, fall to pieces, there's a chair behind them, they can sit down on that. Um, and so a lot of people focus on the knee valgus and make sure that the midline of your knee is tracking over the midline of your foot and stay upright through the torso and don't allow the knees to come in too far. Don't let them rock out too far. Mm -hmm. So with her, what I did was just, I got her to do a couple of squats and it was just, okay, I just want you to do a few squats up out of the chair. Just think about how it feels. Does the knee hurt? Just think about how it feels. And then I was watching her do that and she was having a fair bit of the knee valgus happening and she was getting that patellofemoral irritation more on the lowering portion, sort of around that halfway range where we start to get that friction point at the patellofemoral region. Um, so what I do with that is I find that instead of worrying about knee valgus and the knee tracking is the three points of pressure in the feet. I don't know if you remember me banging on about that 10,000 times, but just getting her to focus on even pressure underneath the big toe joint, underneath the little toe joint and underneath the heel, yeah. even before doing the movement, just shifting weight through the feet till you've got those three points. And that's all I asked her to think about. Just think about the three points, keep them locked and loaded the whole time, drive out through the three points and make sure you keep that loading throughout those three points on the lowering down. and there was no knee pain, the valgus tidied up. And so there was only one thing she had to pay attention to yeah. and the entire movement was a lot better and it was just the one cue. So what I like to do with people and the tech, not the technique, but the movement cues will change. So if we're say doing a calf raise exercise or we're doing a deadlift or something like that, we're wanting to target the correct muscles. So I think if we focus more on, are you feeling it in this area? And then often what I'll do is the technique cues may change based on the individual. Cause what makes sense to one person will be different to someone else. Yep. So like, I think if we go, okay, can you feel it in the hamstrings? Yes or no. Okay. Well, how about we just move you a little bit this way or that way? Can you feel it in the hamstrings? Yes. So their technique cue might be, okay, if you're not feeling it in the hamstrings, you might have to, and I'm talking in relation to say a stiff leg deadlift. If you're not feeling it in the hamstrings, push your bum further out the back and hinge more from the hips. If you yeah. feel that there, that's fine. So not worrying too much about the torso, not worrying about anything else. Just are you feeling it in the right area? Yes, that's great. If you're not, just go back to the one movement cue and then tweak that and then you should feel it there. So that's one thing that I find works quite better. And so you can simplify down the movement cues, but also you create a cue based on what makes sense to the person, if that makes sense. Yeah. And that'll increase their um, understanding and therefore their in compliance. So um, yeah, definitely you don't want to give too many cues. Um, and so when I'm giving an exercise, I demonstrate it first, then I get them to do it. Then I explain how I want them to do it with only like one or two cues. And then I explain why I want them to do that, do it that way. So that's probably similar to what you were saying um, as far as activating or, or um, feeling it in the right, the right muscles. Um, yep. Definitely, definitely good. What about, um, so another thing that my 10 year old um, kid today, I'm not going to see them for um, a month is I'm getting them to, draw up and they were really excited to do this is, is draw up a, um, a calendar and they're going to decorate it and all that sort of thing. And they're going to send me a photo of it. So, um, that's going to be really cool and, and, and cross <laughs> off with each day when they do their exercises. So what do you think about like diaries and stuff like that to, um, increase accountability and ad adherence? Are, are they for everyone or do you have to pick and choose what clients they, they work for or what do you think? I think picking and choosing. So, and that again comes back to, um, you know, how we touched on the exercise. It's a collaboration, not a dictation. Yeah. So for some people, yeah, a diary may work quite well. So there are some people that I'll literally make their schedule. So I'll have Sunday through Saturday, just what they do, tick that off. Other people, they've got their own app. Some of them have fitness app 
trips like um, training peaks or, well, you can't really plan in Strava, but some of them have their own app. So finding what, how they schedule their lives. So with a 10 year old, that's actually quite awesome. I love that. Um, Yeah. So finding out how they schedule things. So for some people, they will set a reminder in their phone and they will just do a repeat Mm -hmm. for that. So I think scheduling is important for some people, but it's figuring out what schedule works for them, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Then there are other people that, like I was saying before, if we can incorporate some of their rehab into physical activities that they're already doing, then we don't really need to schedule it because they've already got that worked into their schedule. We just have to create an environment where they're able to perform their rehab exercises during that scheduled activity that's already on the cards. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and you, um, I know you use a lot more um, exercise prescription applications than I do um, um, as far as you use the rehab lab and stuff like that. Um, but what do you think about, so, um, sometimes I, all all I do is I just get the client's phone and I film them doing the exercise. So, so, and, or I take a photo of them doing the exercise on their phone. So they've got it rather than, um, you know, spending too much time printing out a program and that sort of thing, just take, just get their phone and take a video and photo of it. And then they can see themselves doing it. Maybe they can use that to relate to the exercise a bit more rather than having a a printout of of Google images of people doing exercises. (laughs) Yep. Well, and that's one of the things that like with the rehab lab, because um, like I've got my entire custom library that I've done with there. Um, Like, so there will be, it does take a little bit of faffing around on my end. So sometimes, especially if I'm doing a variation of um, an exercise. So I had one girl the other week who just for the life of us, it didn't matter what hip extension exercise we were working with. We just couldn't get the glutes doing what we wanted them to do. So we came up with some variabilities or variations, sorry. Yeah. So took photos of them and then I've put that into the program. So she's getting her pictures and the description of that, but definitely one of the other things and probably a less time consuming thing to do is yeah, definitely filming it because if that makes sense to the person and it resonates with them, that's completely fine. It's just don't do stick figures. I friggin' hate stick figures. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. No. Um yeah, no, that's good. Do we have any questions so far or anything like that? Um I need to actually open the app. I had to close it down because I was getting that double back. So bear with me, I'll check it out. The, um it's a good topic. Okay. We could talk about it all night. Yeah, oh, I think we could talk about all things all night. <laughs> <laughs> I need dinner though. Um, all right. No, so at the minute, now we're all pretty good for questions. So Great. basically, if we had to sum it up for yeah. what makes an exercise program more compliant. Yeah. Do you want to hit the summary or do you want me to hit the summary? We can both hit the summary. Um, all right. So I reckon um, communication, um, collaboration, and goal setting relating to your goals or to their goals. Sorry. Not, definitely not your goals. Relate it to their goals. Yes. <laughs> that, I agree with that. So I think, yeah, if we can explain the what, like what they're doing, why they're doing it, and how it's going to get them to why they're actually there in the first place to achieve their goals. And it's just that don't overcomplicate things, keep things simple. And I think one tip for practitioners is practice one, doing the movements yourself. So if you have that increased awareness of movement, so for example, we use the car phrase as an example. So a lot of people, they will tend to sort of ride a little bit more laterally when they do a calf raise. Mm-hmm. And one of my movement cues is drive down evenly through the big toe joint and the little toe joint that kind of tidies up a lot of that. So I think for practitioners practicing the movements themselves and am I feeling it in the area that I should be even the glute bridge is another good example. So am I feeling it in the glutes? Am I feeling it in the hamstrings? Is my lower back hurting? 
mucking around with their technique. So the more that you actually perform an exercise and you learn to tweak yourself, then that actually makes it easier to communicate to the person. So one, do the exercises yourself. So you have a feeling of how it actually feels and practice explaining it. So the more, yeah, you can condense it down and the simpler, and this goes with explaining pathologies, yeah. mechanical concepts, exercises. So the more simple and concise you can consolidate the information down into that in itself, yeah, will work wonders. So yeah, again, communication, practice it yourself and yeah, the following up and building that rapport because it's, yeah, you don't can't just set and forget when it comes to exercise programming, especially when there's a goal in mind because life happens and sometimes, yeah, patients will drop off and they just need a little bit of a reminder or they're not just certain about something or even sometimes you can have a bit of a shitty interaction with a patient during a consult and just um, you may be running late, they may be stressed or something like that. And yeah, so even just following up to maintain and build that rapport just to keep them on track, that helps as well. Sure. Definitely. I think that's a good way to wrap it up. Cool. And text me through that beer. I want to try it. <laughs> Will do. It's a good one. Oh, they're a, bit, they're a bit hit and miss, but um, this one's all right. I'll leave I'll a review to... on untapped. Yeah, I've fallen behind on that. I need to up my game. I need to lose a few kilos and then I'll up my game. <laughs> all right. All right. Thanks That's for the chat, out. mate. I'll